we are happy to greet here again uh, and thankful for that, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, who is joining us today uh, after a long trip all over the Europe. And actually, uh, we are thankful for that even more because he has found this time again for us to give this uh, presentation today about the possibilities about uh, possibilities of Ukraine to join NATO uh, and NATO's membership. I'll give you a little bit of background uh, general about the present audience today. We have students and professors of Austro Academy here who are, who I hope will be actively asking you questions, but at the same time, we have representatives of uh, a few uh, city halls of our region, Austro and Dolbuni. We have representatives of some partner universities from uh, Kyiv, from Horlivka, uh, uh, we also have some, some representatives from the universities from Finland, Portugal, from the Republic of Poland. Uh, we are happy to have them here in frames of three different European projects that we are executing at the National University of Ostrov Academy. The first one is academic response to hybrid threats, uh, which we are on the third year of exe execution. Uh, this is a capacity building in higher education Erasmus Plus project. We, we are actually in the, uh, as a member of the consortium of the Finnish universities, uh, Portuguese universities, French university, and Estonian and seven Ukrainian universities. We have the coordinator from Finland, Professor Timo Tihonen, who is with here us today. Uh, we also uh, have members of two other projects that we actually uh, executing at the, uh, the National University of Australia Academy. One of them is a continuation of the previous project and it's called Self-Regulated Studies of Hybrid Threats and European Security. This is Jean Monnet uh, model project. And another project is Human Rights in European Union. It's also Jean Monnet uh, model project, uh, the head of which is Olha Balatska, the director of Institute of National Security and uh, international relations. So the audience is uh, di diversified. We have students and professors. Uh, we are not going to take any more of your time. We know about the topic uh, uh, of your presentation today. Maybe I'll just, uh, I I'm sure that uh, people all over the place know uh, your biography, but maybe to those new ones who are joining us today and didn't hear us today, uh, I will point out <coughs> a few uh, few moments of your biography that you actually served in, in different countries. You served in Iraq, you served in Afghanistan, uh, and in November 2014, you became the commander of US ground forces in Europe, where you served uh, for four years. Uh, and not, now actually you are representing <clears throat> the organization called Human Rights uh, First, which has uh, offices in Europe and uh, as well in the, in the United States. And if I have missed something, dear general, please correct me and add to your biography whatever you feel that needs to be uh, added. I am not stealing any more of your time and passing the floor to you. Thank you so much. And we'll be keeping 40 minutes maximum. Okay, well, thanks to all of you for the, uh, the privilege of, of your time. Uh, yes, I, I blocked this time many weeks ago uh, when uh, Professor Balatska, you know, asked me if I would do this, and and of course I'm I'm happy to do this. I, I think uh, the future for all of us rests on the shoulders of our students and of their teachers, and so this is a very very high priority for me, uh, and and it's why I'm happy to get the privilege uh, to do this. So uh, uh, to add to my biography, the only thing I would add is to be an unofficial um, friend of the Ostro Academy. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm happy to have that on my biography. <laughs> um, look, the last uh, nine days, I was in Belgium and Norway doing uh, NATO senior mentor duties. Uh, and so I had the chance to listen to a lot of presentations and, and participate in debates about NATO, about Europe. And of course, on the front of everyone's mind is Ukraine and Russia's uh, war against Ukraine. That's That dominates every single conversation, no matter what nation I'm with, 
where I'm located. So I, I just want to convey that to you that while certainly on the surface, we will always see uh, the nations and, and their governments and, and the policies being worked out, uh, but there's no question that um, the people, the circles where I work, Ukraine is on the front of mind of everybody. And everybody is so impressed and wants to see Ukraine win. And we know for us, it's important that Ukraine wins as well. And then I was in Sweden from uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. It's the 500th birthday of the Swedish army. Uh, and they had a change of command uh, of change of commanders for the Swedish army. The, the old commander is a longtime friend of mine. The new commander looks to be exceptional. Um, and of course, they're in Sweden. Ukraine is in the front of everybody's mind. Um, of course, uh, in Sweden, and, and I'll talk about this more specifically, they are very confident that um, Turkey is going to drop its veto uh, and that Sweden will be uh, invited to join the alliance. I think Hungary will not be able to hide behind Turkey um, anymore after this. And, and so I, I don't know that, they'll, that Turkey will announce this in the next few weeks, but I was, I was impressed with how confident uh, the Swedes are about uh, about the process, and I think this is a a good thing. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you that that's what's in the in my mind um, because of my travels over the last uh, yeah, nine days. And I I got back last night. What I'd like to do uh, for the next thirty thirty five minutes is talk briefly about the current situation that I see. The counteroffensive has been underway now for about two weeks. I, I think I should give you my assessment because I think this is on all of your mind as well. And many of you probably have family members that are directly involved in this. Um, I just did an in, uh, interview this morning with uh, UKR Life TV. Uh, that's out on YouTube now, so that's about a 25-minute interview that uh, you may, maybe you want to see that. Um, and then I will talk specifically about the Vilnius Summit that's coming up uh, 11 and 12 July and uh, in, in Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, what we should expect, what I expect, um, and then maybe the next time we meet in uh, I'll work out a date with uh, Professor Balatska uh, for the next time we do this. We could talk about the outcome of the Vilnius Summit and what are what are the impl implications. Um, okay, current situation. I think uh, people are a little bit confused, a little bit concerned. Uh, there's we don't have the same sort of clarity. Uh, after months and months of watching very precise video of drones dropping bombs into trenches and being able to see everything so clearly, uh, now it, it's not so clear. Why is that? Well, this is exactly what you should expect, is that uh, we don't have absolute clarity on what's going on, and none of us in the public are entitled to know exactly what's going on. This is not a movie, this is war. This is violence, this is confusion, and, and it's on a scale that we have not seen for almost 80 years in Europe. And so um, I think you should, people should be patient. Uh, you should be very confident in Ukrainian armed forces, be very confident in Ukrainian general staff. I am, um, keep in mind, that General Zaluzhny has been very good and very disciplined about protecting information, about not helping the Russians to understand what's going on. So what we call OPSEC, operational security, this is the protection of information which helps protect the mission and it also helps protect the lives of the soldiers involved. And so we're going to have to depend on reports that may be two, three, four, five days old to try and understand what's going on. And of course, we know that the Russians are going to use misinformation 
all the time for their own population, but also to confuse us. We already know that some of the pictures that came out in the first days of destroyed vehicles uh, were in fact fake. Uh, and so this is, this is part of the environment. And so I guess my point is that all of us should be patient. It's also useful to know or keep in mind that uh, not only are we in the early days of the offensive, I don't believe the main attack has even started. Ukraine has, I believe, 35, 35 brigades, and a brigade will have anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 soldiers. That's a lot of troops. And you have armor brigades, mechanized brigades, marine brigades, different types. Um, of the 35 brigades in Ukrainian land forces, only four of them are even in the fight. So in other words, the main attack has not even started. And I believe that those four brigades that are fighting very hard right now, already making some progress, they are there looking for vulnerabilities, creating conditions that then when the time is right and the conditions are right, then I think you'll see the general staff directing the main attack in one or two places. And of course, part of this is to confuse the Russians as to where the main attack is taking place. So um, yes, of course, there's gonna be casualties. Yes, of course, it's gonna be difficult. Um, the Russians don't care how many of their own people are killed. And so they will keep um, doing this to absorb Ukraine's attacks. But I remain very optimistic very confident and probably in a few weeks people who were already predicting a disaster are going to look and feel kind of foolish if we look at if we look at the history of my own country um, every war that we've ever been in started off as a disaster even in normandy in 1944 the famous normandy invasion it took us months just to get off of the beaches despite having all the advantages, it was very difficult. And then we were still stopped again just a few months later. And it took a year or 11 months after the Normandy invasion before the United States and our British allies and Canadians were successful on the Western front. So I think everybody should be, uh, uh, keep in mind all the advantages that Ukraine has and the disadvantages that the Russians have. And I think we'll be in a much better place a few weeks from now. So when we get to the, the discussion part here later, I would welcome uh, any challenges or questions or some of you will have insights maybe from what you've seen yourself or from your own family uh, that could help us understand better what's going on. Um, but I just wanted to convey to you that I'm confident that most of the Ukrainian army is not even in the fight yet. That's coming. And that you should expect a, a lag or delays of accurate information um, and that the general staff is doing their best to protect the soldiers and to make sure that the mission is successful. Clearly, it would be helpful, more helpful, if the United States and other countries provided the long range precision weapons that would allow Ukraine to hit targets inside Crimea. Um, I, can't ex I cannot explain that, but Remembering that I'm talking to not journalists, but I'm speaking to students and to faculty members, as you as you think about um, how a nation develops its policy and its strategy, this this is part of what you're doing. This is part of what you're studying in your courses, and and uh, maybe this this conversation today will help inform your discussions about how do nations form their policy. What are all the factors? that go into that policy. For me, obviously, I wish that my, my president would say, we want Ukraine to win. We're gonna give everything that's needed right now as fast as possible. But of course, the president of the United States has responsibilities way beyond what I have. Uh, he has information way beyond what I have. And of course, he's not worried just about Ukraine or just about Europe. He's dealing with China. He's dealing with Iran. He's dealing with North Korea. And of course, his number one priority 
when it comes to Europe is going to be to keep the alliance together. Alliance unity is number one priority um, because that's what makes NATO the most successful alliance. So as all of you are thinking about how nations form their policy, uh, I would encourage you to think about what are all the factors that influence policy. It's not just security. It's also about alliances, coalitions. It's about economy. It's about priorities. And maybe this is the hardest thing. How do you, some of you listening today will be advisors in your government. You have, you have to be able to recommend priorities to the leadership. And when, and when you say priorities, that means there's always going to be somebody that loses. You, you cannot possibly put resources and energy against everything. So you have to prioritize. That's, that's, that's the real challenge. And that's where moral courage also um, is needed. So I think uh, my president um, has to think about priorities. He has to think about our economy. He has to think about all the threats. Um, I don't know, but I'm sure that China is conveying um, to the United States and other countries what kind of outcome they want with Ukraine. I'm sure that they do not want to see a Russian collapse. I think that probably influences some of this, uh, some of the thinking. Um, of course, Secretary Blinken was just in China the last two days, um, and now he's headed to London, I think, where he will participate in the Ukraine uh, Reconstruction Conference. So there's the, the top diplomat for the United States. He's in China working hard to make sure that our relationship with China does not tip over into conflict. Um, but Secretary Blinken, as I'm sure many of you have read, had a very um, robust, candid discussion with his counterpart and also with President Xi, uh, speaking honestly about what are the problems that we have with China? Where are our differences? And the Chinese still refuse to reopen communications or to allow communications between the US military and the Chinese military. Um, so this this is a very difficult situation here, but Secretary Blinken is working on that, and then he flies to Europe to work on Ukraine's reconstruction. So this is what I mean. Uh, a lot of things are happening out there, um, and that affects how U.S. policy, British policy, German policy, all the nations uh, are thinking about things. So I'll leave that there and start talking next about NATO specifically, and the Vilnius Summit. And when we come back at, uh, after a, a few minutes, we can address any of these things in, in the discussion. So NATO typically has a summit at least every two years. Sometimes they'll be each year, but it's, it's not required. But the norm is every two years or once a year. The last summit, of course, was the Madrid summit this year in Vilnius. And then next year, the 75th anniversary of NATO will be in Washington, D.C. Um, I think there are three main sort of topics that are going to be addressed at the Vilnius Summit. Uh, number one, uh, the heads of state and government will review um, all the agreements that were made at the last summit to, to look at progress. Have we implemented all the agreements that were made at the Madrid summit? This includes specifically uh, the development of regional plans for the defense of, of NATO. Uh, it, it includes um, a revision of the command structure. Um, it includes um, have the nations done what they said they would do to increase their investment. I think we will hear uh, conversations about 2%, not as the target, but as the floor, as the minimum. Uh, so this represents a significant change in the, um, in the tone and in the realization by nations of the threat that Russia poses as well as other threats. So I think uh, that'll be one of the main sort of categories or themes is implementation of the Madrid summit. A second sort of theme will address NATO enlargement, specifically 
Sweden. I don't know this for a fact, uh, but I feel very confident. I feel more confident now than I did last week that uh, Turkey is going to drop its veto uh, at some point and that Sweden will be uh, able to access into, into NATO. Hungary, of course, is the other country that has uh, so far uh, vetoed, uh, but I think once Turkey drops its veto, it will be more difficult for Hungary uh, by itself. Uh, it does not have the same sort of leverage uh, that Turkey does. We'll see. But I would imagine that there is a lot of conversation. There are a lot of conversations going on. Uh, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, was with President Erdogan just a few days ago. Uh, he conveyed very clearly to President Erdogan our expectation that um, Turkey would uh, drop its veto. Sweden has done everything that uh, Turkey has asked um, while still respecting its own uh, democratic uh, policies and laws. Uh, of course, uh, Russia has uh, helped provoke demonstrations inside Sweden um, uh, that showed support for the PKK, the Kurdish terrorist group that Turkey is so concerned about. This is being done, of course, to create uh, problems to make it difficult for Turkey to be able to uh, drop its veto. But I think Ankara recognizes that this is a this is not Sweden, but this is more a deliberate attempt by the Kremlin to provoke and to create problems. This is the environment we're in. So I think that we'll hear something about Sweden. I can't guarantee it because I don't control it, but I I feel more optimistic now than I did last week. The third sort of category um, that will come out. And of course, there'll be lots of different things, but the third big piece is about Ukraine. Um, I don't expect that the alliance will offer membership uh, to Ukraine at the Vilnius summit. Uh, I don't think that's realistic. And I, I don't think anybody in Kyiv uh, believes that that's going to be uh, coming out. Um, and I don't think that we will hear uh, of a MAP membership action plan as a formal uh, offer. I don't. I don't expect that. But having said those two things, I do expect there to be other forms of concrete steps uh, that the alliance is going to offer to Ukraine to make it absolutely clear uh, that this is not some open-ended thing like the uh, invitation back in Bucharest in 2008, where it was announced that Ukraine would one day become a member. To do that again uh, would be a mistake uh, because that would, uh, that would only exacerbate the existing problems. I think instead the Alliance is going to uh, look for concrete steps to do things that look and sound and feel like membership action plan but won't have that title. And this is necessary to keep all 31 nations on side. And as, I, as you heard me say earlier, maintaining the unity of the alliance is always going to be number one. And when you've got 31 nations that have their own agendas, that have their own priorities to keep all 31 on side, uh, that's a challenge. And so that's why I think you'll see um, concrete steps coming out that all 31 could agree on. And what I have heard from many different people of many different nations, including Central and Western Europe, as well as the United States and Canada, is that yes, of course, we want to see Ukraine in NATO, but they can't say it that way so formally, uh, at least not yet. Um, now, so what are those concrete steps? There are a variety of, um, possible models that have been suggested. One, which is, I've already said, the least likely is an outright invitation. I don't expect that. Uh, number two would be a formal statement saying that after Ukraine has defeated Russia, after Ukraine has won, then Ukraine would be invited to join. Um, that seems unlikely because 
Russia then would never ever stop. They, they would continue the conflict somehow in order to prevent, if that was one of the preconditions, then Russia would have no incentive to surrender or leave or, or give up or negotiate in anything if they knew that that would lead to Ukrainian membership. And half the reason, or half the nations that object to Ukrainian membership do so because they believe it's impossible uh, and inappropriate uh, to uh, invite any nation into the alliance that is already in a conflict, that's already in a war. Now, people have argued different uh, things. You know, Germany came into NATO when it was already divided with East Germany being occupied by Soviet troops. Um, it's not an exact parallel, however. So I don't think that the idea that a formal offer to come in after Ukraine wins, I don't think that's likely. Uh, some people talk about the Israeli model, which is to give Ukraine everything it needs so that it could defend itself uh, until some future date. That sounds good, except we already don't give Ukraine everything it needs. So I don't, I don't know that that's realistic to expect that all of a sudden we would provide a lot more on top of what's already being done. And of course, Israel has a nuclear weapon, which uh, puts it in a, in a different sort of category. And the kind of threats it faces are not the same sort of threat that um, uh, Ukraine faces. So you will hear people talk about the Israeli model. I would, uh, um, that, that's worth in, in your classes discussing, what does that actually mean? Obviously the United States has agreements with Israel that we would come to their aid. Uh, I would imagine that the United States uh, and other countries perhaps, uh, and this is one of the other models, that was offered by former Secretary General uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen that some nations, some sort of a coalition, would be willing to establish a security guarantee of some sort for Ukraine. I imagine we'll see some variation of that uh, that will come out. Um, more training, uh, more security cooperation, perhaps. But the key is going to be, what is the situation when the fighting stops? And I think as long as Russia occupies Crimea, it will be very difficult to apply any of these um, models that I've talked about. So how, how, does, how does the alliance, you know, the nations have, different nations have different uh, perspectives on this. Obviously, the nations that are closest to Russia, such as uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, um, Finland um, feel very strongly that uh, Ukraine should be in the alliance and that it's in the interest of, of it's in their interest uh, that we are strong and very clear in our support for Ukraine, uh, even though they, they have the most at risk given their proximity to Ukraine. I think that's, that um, says a lot. And it's also interesting, one of the topics that you hear a lot now in NATO circles and in Europe is how the, the center of gravity of, of power, of influence in Europe is, is shifting towards the East. Um, as the Baltic nations, as Poland, as Romania, and now with Finland coming into NATO, uh, Finland and Sweden becoming more and more um, prevalent in, in defense and in, in politics, uh, more influential, um, that center of gravity is shifting to the east. And I think this is partly a result of uh, Germany and France have, have been um, uncertain. They have not been decisive in saying, this is what's got to happen. This is what needs to be done. And so... Um, I think that there is a, uh, Eastern European countries are having more influence now inside NATO than would have been the case five years ago. I think partly because of that, both Chancellor Schultz and President Macron have been much more uh, clear and decisive in their public remarks over the last year than, than ever before. I was in Bratislava in Slovakia three weeks ago, 
President Macron was one of the speakers there at the Globesec Forum. And I've never heard him speak like that before, where he talked about the importance of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty, of Ukrainian getting all of its territory back, the importance of Europe and the United States working together. In, in my mind, he kind of uh, put to rest this notion that somehow Europe could be by itself. Uh, it was a much more uh, statesmanlike and, and muscular uh, approach by President Macron than I'd heard before. And of course, even uh, members of, of his government have also been very clear about the need for uh, Ukraine to, um, to be successful and, and for um, us not to allow Russia to get away with what it's doing. So I guess what I'm saying is you can sort of feel there is a, uh, a growing pressure by Central and Eastern European countries on the rest of the alliance uh, to support Ukraine and to find a way to give Ukraine some sort of security, security guarantee until Ukraine comes into the alliance. Keep in mind, and again, I'm, sp I'm speaking to you now as a guest uh, lecturer to students and faculty as you think about how you would formulate policy, how you would make recommendations, understand that all 31 of these heads of state and government every leader of every country in NATO and in the European Union, they each have their own domestic challenges that they're dealing with. They have to remain in power. Most of them lead coalition governments. They're dealing with inflation. They're dealing with energy challenges. They're dealing with migrant crisis. And they're, and they're having to invest more resources into their own defense. All of these are very, very hard problems. And so um, to, to come together uh, on really important policies that affect all of us is a challenge. So that's what's going on. So the more I think about it, the more patient I am with leaders, as long as they're being honest, um, the more patient I am with them for having to make these hard decisions. Let me um, address now the United States in this whole process, and then I will turn it uh, back over uh, to y'all um, for uh, our, our discussion. The United States has, um, I can't tell if my president, where he is exactly on Ukrainian membership. I think if he was 100% in favor of it and wanted it to happen now, he would be talking about it. I think in his heart and in his mind, he knows that this is where it needs to be, that Ukraine uh, that the alliance will be stronger once Ukraine is in the alliance, that Europe will be uh, more secure once it's in the alliance, um, and that this will influence how China perceives things. Uh, but it's not a simple decision. I think that the, uh, the Chinese loom very large in his thinking. And I think he also is trying to uh, resuscitate the... Uh, uh, Iran nuclear agreement. My president, as he should be, is obviously very concerned about a nuclear accident or a nuclear war or anybody having that capability uh, to use nuclear weapons as blackmail anywhere. And so I think he's dealing with competing priorities uh, and trying to figure out how do we protect the international rules-based order from which we have benefited for so long? How do we protect our allies? How do we find a way to ensure there's no conflict with China? And how do we hold Russia accountable for what it's doing? Uh, these, these are all competing interests uh, that, and of course, here in the United States will require strong congressional support. And all of you know that in the United States, <clears throat> we have our own internal domestic challenges. So this is part of the president's uh, burden as well, is to keep the Congress uh, focused moving forward to continue to support Ukraine, to continue to support uh, American involvement in Europe, as well as make sure we have the rules and regulations and policies in place to protect American business interests, especially when we're talking about China. Okay, let me stop there. And uh, I've got about 40 more minutes 
uh, that we can uh, talk about everything that you want to talk about. Thank you so much, General, for the interesting analysis and actually very informative topics uh, concerning Ukraine's possibilities to join the NATO and actually about the American policy towards Ukraine. Uh, so now, dear friends, let us uh, have questions. If you have questions, oh, I see so many hands up. All right, let me see. Okay, Yaroslav Burkut, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Hodges. Uh, uh, my name is Yaroslav Burkut, and I'm a student of Star Academy, a second year student of the Department of uh, International Relations. And uh, fortunately, I have another opportunity to ask you a question. And um, my question regards to West integrated strategy, West de integrated defense strategy. Uh, as we know, recently in Brussels, uh, West, uh, Western leaders had a meeting and uh, uh, at that regard, they reached the consensus uh, of extending their military spending. Jan Stoltenberg has proclaimed that 2% of the uh, nation's GDP is uh, from now on has to be a minimum amount that countries have to spend on their military defense. And uh, from this statement, I want to ask you, what do you think uh, are the prospects of uh, Western defense architecture? And uh, what is the place of the USA in the modern European strategy of defense? Thank you. Uh, Yaroslav, thank you. I remember you from last time and you asked a difficult question last time also. So, uh, <laughs> and this is a good one here. The um, First of all, the United States is always going to stay involved uh, in Europe and in NATO uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, all of our best and most reliable allies in the world come from Europe, as well as Canada, Australia, Japan, and, and South Korea. So, um, and, and we need allies. So we're going to stay involved uh, in Europe and in NATO regardless. Plus, our economy depends so much on a prosperous Europe. America's economy, our, Europe is our biggest, or the European Union is our biggest trading partner. So uh, the United States is gonna stay connected to Europe for that reason. Now, of course, um, there's a reason somebody like President Trump was able to get a lot of support was because he talked about Europeans did not do their share. Now, that was, a, I think, a, a, a very, dishonest approach the way he did it. But nonetheless, he got a lot of public support because of that. So uh, you're going to see continued um, pressure from the United States on all of the allies to do their share, not just spending, but also infrastructure, readiness, capabilities, and so on. Um, I think it will be difficult to get um, everybody uh, with 2% as the floor not just the target, but I think that's the right approach. Uh, Germany will be key here. Uh, if Germany does it, then that will put a lot of pressure on other countries uh, to do it. But as long as Germany falls short, then I think some countries will hide behind uh, Germany uh, in that process. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for the answer, General. Okay, another Yaroslav, please. Yaroslav, please put your hand down. Okay, good, good afternoon, Mr. Hodges. It's an enormous pleasure for me to caught up in another great lecture from you. As the last time I didn't actually have a chance to ask you a question, but this is a great opportunity for me as well. So my name is Yaroslav. I am a second year student from the Department of International Relations of National University oh, of Stock okay. Academy. So I have a question that is relatable to an entire NATO system. As lastly, there was a news that President Joe Biden and his NATO counterparts are due to choose a successor when they meet for a summit in Vilnius. So no candidate has been proposed publicly and leaders usually decide by consensus on who should be appointed. But at the same time, there is an understanding among other states that Jens Stoltenberg should be elected for another term as well as there are some applic applicants, applicants for a senior chair at NAT NATO Alliance system like Prime Minister of Denmark, Mette Frederiksen, and Secretary of State for Defense of the United Kingdom, Ben Wallace. So how it could affect NATO and what are your personal thoughts about it? Thank you very much. 
Uh, Yaroslav, thank you. It's an excellent, really an excellent question. Um, so the the Secretary General of NATO has to be somebody that can keep keep everybody uh, moving forward together. Uh, so to be able to build consensus of 31 nations, soon to be at least 32 and hopefully more. Um, and and you've seen firsthand over the past two years, with whether it's or the past few years, during Stoltenberg's time, issues with Turkey, Turkey and Greece, uh, the former US president, um, or even the French president saying that NATO was brain dead. So you've got to have somebody that is uh, on eye level, as the Germans would say, Augenhöhe, that can look in the face of a president or prime minister, or Bundeskanzler, uh, and and look at them and treat them as a as an equal, um, and they can understand why Portugal and Italy and Greece will have different priorities than Poland or or Norway or uh, Bulgaria, for example, or Turkey. So it's got to be a person like that who can also communicate. Um, and, and the Secretary General of NATO, of course, participates in many other international fora, not just in NATO, but he goes to things like, uh, you know, G7, G20, you know, uh, participates uh, indirectly in those kinds of uh, venues as well. I think, um, of course, it would, a lot of people would probably breathe a sigh of relief if he stayed one more year. Um, maybe through uh, till next year, the 75th anniversary, not because of the anniversary, but because of all that's happening right now. Uh, his leadership um, is really important. Uh, it would suit me fine. Personally, I would be thrilled if he agreed to stay for another year. But every every institution has to refresh. And, uh, you know, he's a human also. And I mean, how much can we keep depending on one person uh, to keep carrying this load. So we'll see. Uh, there, fortunately, Europe has millions of talented people, and you named several very talented women and men already that are names who are frequently mentioned. Uh, I personally really like uh, the Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaya Kallis. She is impressive. Uh, she does not have uh, a lot of defense experience, but she's a head of a government and she's a wonderful speaker. Uh, Mr. Wallace is another person for whom I have enormous respect. Obviously he has great defense experience, but he's not been a prime minister. So he's not been a head of state or head of government. That may or may not be a problem, but I think that, uh, and of course, I think uh, Lord Robertson, when he became secretary general, he had not been prime minister. He had been defense minister. So there is a, a precedent for that. Um, I think that the Central and East, or the Eastern European countries are looking for somebody that comes from Eastern Europe uh, that would be more attentive to this. Uh, so these are all the kind of factors that are out there. I think there is a, a sentiment to have a woman uh, to be the Secretary General. Um, I would I would never ever disqualify somebody because they were a woman or a man. But that should not be the reason to pick somebody because there it's a woman or a man. I think that the, uh, the Danish prime minister, the uh, Estonian prime minister, and there are other extremely accomplished women uh, who would be very good as a secretary general. Um, so that's that's a non-answer to, to the question, um, but that's that's, how I would assess the candidates that are out there, um, a good choice and probably the safe choice for now would be if Secretary General Stoltenberg stayed for another year. His his wife may have a voice a vote on that too, though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, General, for this <laughs> wonderful answer. <laughs> Natalia, please. Just a moment. We would um, like to ask you to turn on your camera, please. Yes, yes, just one moment. 
Uh, can you see me now? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes, so um, it's a great honor for me to be able to uh, ask you a question. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, well, uh, you have mentioned uh, that uh, the Alliance might offer some steps to Ukraine and not even a plan of membership. So what kind of steps may those be? Could you please clarify? Yeah. So uh, one of the steps, well, first of all, the, the overall message coming out of, of Vilnius should be loud and clear to everybody that's watching that all the nations of NATO are committed to continuing the support for Ukraine, that Russia is the aggressor, it cannot be business as usual, <clears throat> and that the nations will continue to not only improve our own defense, but to provide Ukraine what it needs. So that that has to be one of the uh, the, the the music or the, the the tone that comes out of Vilnius, unmistakable. And I think it also has to be unmistakable that there is a plan for Ukraine to come to NATO that is not somewhere out in the future. It may not be called the membership action plan, but it has to be very clear, not only to Ukraine uh, and to other countries in Europe, it has to be very clear to the Kremlin that they do not get to decide Ukraine's future. Uh, otherwise, I think the Vilnius summit will be seen as a failure. Now, to specific steps. One of the things that I hear the most frequent is that um, the current relationship between Ukraine and NATO would be elevated from a commission status to a council status. So that's, that's the kind of thing that would typically be in a membership action plan, for example. So I, I think this will be a good thing. It will give Ukraine access to a lot more of NATO's procedures, meetings, uh, participation in a way uh, much more than what it's able to do right now. I think that would be a very powerful signal. That would be telling the Kremlin that Ukraine's relationship with um, NATO is more important than Russia's relationship with NATO. Um, you'll, you'll remember that the NATO-Russia Council has been put on ice um, ever since its invasion. Uh, and I would hope, by the way, that uh, in the same process that the alliance would say that the NATO-Russia Council is no more um, at, at the same time as elevating uh, Ukraine to a council status with NATO. I think that we will probably see um, uh, or should see uh, offers for Ukraine to provide officers uh, in a partner status to participate in exercises and staffs uh, to, to do more active hands-on type things um, as part of the alliance, as, as part of a um, preparation, if you will, to build up commonality, understanding of standards, et cetera. Those, those are some of the kind of things uh, I would expect to see. What, what will not come from NATO, but, would, but what would likely come from nations would be nations offering to do more exercises uh, or, or other security type arrangements, like what the U.S. already does with the creation of the uh, support uh, security advisory group, Ukraine, which is down the street here in, um, in Wiesbaden. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. We do share your opinion that Ukraine has the right to actually choose our own future. Yes, Sofia, did you please? Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Sonia Dechuk. I'm the first year student of international relations. And my question is in Ukraine, there are great concerns about future USA elections. Should we be worried about the attitude of a future American president towards war inside our country? What can you say about the mindset of uh, American people towards the war in Ukraine? Thank you. Yeah, this is a, this for me is a, a hard question to answer because um, it, it's hard to admit that we have millions of people millions that would vote for Donald Trump today. Um, it, it's incredible to me, but, but that's a fact. Um, 
that uh, such a, a sizable percentage of our population are willing to tolerate his corruption, um, his abuse of our constitution, um, and also his very selfish, narcissistic um, behavior. It's it's embarrassing for me as an American to uh, to have to explain that, but it's a fact. And so what I do, I don't I don't sit here in my at my desk and, and complain about it. Uh, I do what I can to influence and educate my fellow Americans about why it's important that a person like Donald Trump never be allowed to be our president again. That there certainly there are other better choices, but. Um, all of you can see this yourself. You see it on, uh, in social media or on TV, or you can read about it. Um, there is there is a part of our society that has, uh, they are either uh, religious fanatics, I mean, almost like Taliban, um, that are very intolerant. Uh, we also have a part of our society, I think, that has fascist tendencies, that they they don't believe that everybody truly is uh, should have equal opportunity. So these are huge debates in the United States. And so you have some candidates are willing to exploit that the way that Trump did. I think that uh, Governor DeSantis of Florida, which is my home state, by the way, um, he seems a lot, he's, he's not so vulgar like the former president, um, but he uh, he is actually I think uh, a right-wing extremist, uh, and he's willing to use, uh, take advantage of re religious fanaticism, at least during the election period. Now, who knows if he becomes president? Uh, maybe he uh, grows into the job. But you know, that's what we thought with Trump. We thought that Trump, once he became elected, he would not act like the guy he was, and it turns out he was even worse. So. Um, this election coming up next year is going to be a challenge. Now, I actually believe President Biden will be reelected. Uh, you, the things that the president is responsible for, our economy, uh, improving infrastructure, improving our security, improving our relationships with other countries, I think he's making progress in every one of these categories. Um, the the problem the challenge of course is his age and and he comes across as an old man um so th this will this will be a problem for some voters especially if they're not real keen on his vice president they'll worry so as usually is the case i mean even when president obama was elected twice you know 40 40 40 to 5 40 to 45 percent of the country voted against him so it's uh, important that people show up to vote, what we call voter turnout. And so I think um, uh, the President Biden will um, highlight the economic uh, successes of his administration, uh, the work that's been done to prevent a conflict with China, uh, work that's been done in other areas, the strengthening of NATO, and uh, also to remind people that their right-wing extremists um, have uh, done, taken a lot of steps in many states to uh, undercut women's rights, to uh, make it harder for minorities to vote. So this, this is going to be a, a, an election based not just on economic considerations, but also on cultural considerations. And so getting turnout, getting people to vote. And I think young people are going to come out and vote in huge numbers for President Biden, even though he's three or four times older than they are uh, because of what he represents and the threat that the other side represents. But I think the point of your question is, should Ukrainians, should Europeans be worried about the outcome of the election? Well, I can't tell you that there's nothing to worry about. That would not be uh, honest. But I have been impressed that the Congress, Republicans and Democrats, 
in a very strong bipartisan way, continues to support Ukraine, continues to support American leadership in NATO, continues to support providing uh, million, billions and billions of dollars for Ukraine. So that gives me hope that um, the uh, what what happens next year. And remember, we're talking about 18 months or 17 months from now, a year and a half from now is the presidential election. A lot is going to happen in those next 17 months. Thanks. Thank you, General. We do agree with your optimism about the support of, by both Republicans and Democrats, actually, of the Ukrainians during all this time. We do appreciate all those efforts, especially nowadays when we do feel uh, increased in support from the side of Republicans. I, I don't think that I don't think Oksana was very happy with my answer, the way when when she kind of said thanks. Sophia, <laughs> Sophia, were you happy with the answer? <laughs> <laughs> I think she was. I think she was. Professor Yuri Matsyevsky, please. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for giving the floor. Uh, this is the time for professors to, to ask questions. Uh, thank you very much, General Hodges, for your, I'm very, happy to hear. For your very, very uh, insightful uh, and sincere uh, presentation, and especially about the, the U.S. policy towards Ukraine. My question actually would be directed uh, in, in this same way. How would you define the, the Biden's administration actual and uh, ultimate goal in this war? Let me uh, give you some uh, context uh, why I'm asking this. In, in Ukraine, we do not uh, have a sense of a clear U.S. goal in this war. We, uh, we feel and we understand the support, and that's critical. But uh, we never heard Biden saying that Ukraine should win the war, or his Secretary of State saying that Ukraine should win the war. We all often heard that Biden was saying that Ukraine will never lose the war, meaning that if no party will have a upper hand, or winning the situation, so there should be some sort of compromise. And we often hear that uh, uh, different uh, countries, uh, mediators or parties are proposing some sort of a compromise. So if, uh, if the goal of, in the United States is to have the attrition war when uh, both sides will be in a position that they will never be able to continue, it, so there will be a compromise. Mm. But Ukrainian society will not accept it. That's important to understand. We mm. have 93% 90, of people saying that believing in a victory, and we have uh, more than 80% people that will never buy any sort of territorial concessions. So that's important to understand. So in, in this difficult, diff, difficult situation, so how do you think the Biden's mission should navigate and what, if they have any sort of a clear vision of the ultimate goal. How, please explain. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you, uh, Professor Maciejewski. Um, I, I think you've actually done a good job of laying out the, the challenge. Um, uh, and I also, uh, every chance I get, whenever I, I speak with somebody from the government um, or the Congress, I ask, what, what is America's objective here? And, and that is the first responsibility of our elected civilian leadership is to clarify what's the goal. What are we trying to accomplish? We never did this in Afghanistan. We didn't do it in Iraq. We didn't do it in Vietnam. We did not do it in Korea. And so when you don't lay out the clear objective, then you it's difficult to put together the right policies. And I think that's where we are right now. Um, the administration does not say, and you're exactly right, um, does not say we want Ukraine to win. And it's very frustrating for me, as I'm sure it is for your president and for Ukrainian people. Why not? Um, I think, as I said at the beginning, that my president uh, is trying to balance a lot of competing priorities. I am proud of what he's done to keep 50 nations together. Uh, I'm sure the Kremlin never dreamed that the U.S. 
and our allies and other friends would stick together for so long uh, with, with Ukraine. Um, but what do I think his goal is? Of course, they'll never say it. They can't say it. But I think based on what I see from their actions is, number one, that Ukraine does not lose, that it, that it's not, that it survives, that Russia does not collapse, and that there is no World War III, no nuclear war. I think, I think that's what, um, as I look at the actions, that's what it looks like. They don't say that other than the no World War III part, but it seems to me from their actions that they don't want to provide capabilities that would lead to a total Russian collapse. And I think that's partly the influence of China. I think China absolutely does not want to see a Russian collapse for its own reasons, not because they love Russia, but because of their own strategic reasons. Um, and uh, also I think because the administration, the people in the administration, these are the same Russia experts that were there in the Obama administration, which I think did not do a good job of understanding Russia. And it's just the same people again. And um, I think they, they cannot even imagine what would happen. How do you deal with Russia where there's a collapse of the, of the current regime? They don't, they don't know what else is out there. So I think that's not a very a happy answer for you, but that's just my analysis of what I think unstated um, their, uh, their objectives are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ivan, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Hodges. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your actions. And um, I would like to emphasize that we are really glad to see you again. And my question is about missile defense and air defense of Ukraine. Because, uh, yeah, it's hard to disagree that now Ukraine has. Uh, a uh, much bigger potential of uh, defending critical infrastructure and um, its airspace at all. But enlarging our air defense potential is crucial for our safety. And so my question is about uh, after our Ukrainian victory, but before joining Ukraine to NATO, uh, can we uh, join to some United States uh, uh, missile defense system in uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, uh, also known as European interceptor site to protect our airspace from Russia's violation and provocations. Thank you. Ivan, thank you. That, that is really a very good question. Um, I would say it's probably unlikely uh, in the near term <clears throat> to expect a formal sort of integration, um, even during the Obama administration, uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, building up air and missile defenses in Poland and in the Czech Republic uh, were put on hold because there was concern that this would be seen as escalatory uh, against the Russians. We're in a, it's a different set of circumstances right now, but I'm not sure all that thinking uh, has gone away but you you point out, and, and really I, I'm impressed. Uh, you you reveal a couple of things. Number one, that you understand that air and missile defense has to be integrated. It's not just about having a Patriot or a Sam T or Iris T or some system sitting there. Um, it's about a a network of of sensors, radar, headquarters, different types of capabilities that can hit incoming, uh, whether it's missiles or drones or aircraft, each of them requires a different type system. So the idea of an integrated air and missile defense system is, uh, you're exactly right. And of course, um, all of us in the West failed to appreciate the requirement that it is so much more than what we thought it was, because I guess, I know I did not I didn't imagine that Russia would launch multi-million dollar precision weapons against apartment buildings. So our civilian 
infrastructure, civilian populations are now targets. So you, that means that the requirement for, for defense is a much greater, is, is much greater than what we had originally anticipated. I can imagine um, and hope that in, in the next, within the next year or two, you're going to see a much closer cooperation between the United States and Ukraine on uh, air and missile defense. Uh, we have a lot to learn from what Ukraine has done, how Ukraine has been so adaptive uh, at protecting its assets and, and so successful in knocking down so many different Russian weapons. Um, so I, I would imagine this integration that you talk about is going to happen. Uh, I just don't see it happening in the next year or two. Thank you very much. We, we can't hear. Thank you so much, uh, General. I'm going to give the word to my colleague from Jagiellonian University, Vice Director of Institute of Public Health, Professor Thomas Bohanek, please. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General Hodges, for the possibility to, uh, to listen to you. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the, um, the Edward and uh, Ostroch Academy uh, for for uh, this opportunity to to be with you. I'm from uh, Jagiellonian University, which is the partner um, academic institution of uh, Ostro Academy. I there are many questions I would like to to ask, but uh, maybe just two or, or three. Uh, first one is a bit related to Sofia's question. Um, uh, from the viewpoint of uh, states of Central and Eastern Europe, I suppose uh, there is some kind of threat of. Um, something which is probably not very possible now, but still it is a threat. It is um, a appearance of some kind of isolationism in, in the USA. Doesn't matter Democrats or Republicans, but uh, uh, if su uh, such thing happened, uh, there would be possibly a threat uh, of return to uh, concert of powers, uh, you, you know, for, for, um, uh, le leaving matters in Europe, uh, focusing on uh, competition with China and um, possibly creation of a new uh, alliance between Russia and Germany, cheap energy, uh, good cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you think that uh, uh, countries like um, uh, Poland, Ukraine, Central and Eastern Europe should, just in case, uh, prepare somehow for such unfavorable scenario? So it is one question. And second question relates to the situation on uh, Polish-Belarusian uh, border. Um, there, are cons there is constant threat of uh, attacks, hybrid attacks. Uh, the perception of um, uh, of this pressure, mi migrant pressure, migrants purposefully brought to the border and then forced to cross the the border. Uh, the perceptions in uh, European Union countries are very different, um, uh, but definitely it is a threat. It, it, it is a big threat. So, what is your opinion on this? Uh, threat, uh, how serious it is, and uh, how it should be tackled. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks. Professor, thank you, and I'm happy to see the uh, Jagiellonian uh, University uh, here participating as well. Uh, yes, you're right that there is a, a tendency in American politics towards isolationism. It's, it's been there for over two centuries. I mean, people came here in the beginning, uh, because they wanted to get away from Europe, the, the constant wars, and, and, and to, to do something separately. And, and of course, uh, as, as you well know, uh, we had help from uh, Polish and other patriots that helped us earn that independence. Um, and, and our geography of course, reinforces this, having oceans on both sides and uh, friendly neighbors uh, to our north in Canada and Mexico to the south. It's a, it's a different, so it creates a different mindset. But I, th I think that, yes, there will always be some degree of that. Why can't Europe solve their own problems? But by people who are thoughtful, who are educated, who are understand that America's prosperity depends on European prosperity, that America's security depends on European security, 
I think most members of the Congress understand this. Most people who are influential understand this, even if they may not fully appreciate and, and identify every country on a map in Europe, they understand this. And so I'm less worried about isolationism. I'm more worried about the uh, religious fanaticism and uh, fascist tendencies of some people in the right wing uh, of American politics. And, and so that's why I, I do what I can on my own level to try and encounter that, but to inform people why Europe is so important to American prosperity and security. Uh, now, you asked the, an important question, should Poland and, and uh, Baltic countries and, and other others be concerned and, and be prepared for the possibility of a return of Trump or somebody like him? Well, I would say that you already have two excellent institutions that do that. Obviously, one is NATO, uh, a, a collective defense alliance. There's a reason nations want to join NATO, uh, but just joining the club doesn't guarantee security. Nations have to do their part as members of the alliance, as Poland is doing. But you also have the European Union. Look, the, the Union is not perfect, just like NATO is not perfect, just like the United States is not perfect. But it's an incredible institution that was brought together by nations that have generally shared values. And so if you want the benefit of belonging to the union for economic reasons, for health reasons, uh, for uh, diplomatic reasons, then that means every nation has to contribute in a way in, to, to agree to what the union has decided. Easy for me to say, harder to do, uh, and, and particularly in certain countries, but I think uh, this this will be one of the best hedges for European countries would be to make sure that the not only is NATO strong, but that the European Union is strong. Now you talk about Belarus. I agree. This is this is a real concern, and I think this is probably one of the topics that will come out at the Vilnius summit. Uh, the Lithuanians are going to make sure that uh, Belarus is on the uh, is on the agenda. Uh, Obviously, as you talked about, uh, Lukashenko uh, will do what he has to do to satisfy the Kremlin without totally giving up all of his authority and, and sovereignty of Belarus. Um, I think this, this nonsense of pushing uh, migrants uh, against the border of Poland, uh, Lithuania, and Latvia was done to create pressure on those countries and on the European Union. Uh, and also to, I think, maybe to test, to test defenses a little bit. Um, I think that uh, Russia talks about moving tactical nuclear weapons into Belarus. Uh, this, this, of course, is done. Uh, they say that. I don't know that they've actually moved them there yet. But even if they do decide to move them there, it will be months before they could actually use a nuclear weapon from there. So I think this is more about drama and to create anxiety in Western capitals about the potential for nuclear escalation. I'm more concerned about the nuclear power plant at Ostrovets there in, in Western, uh, in Western uh, Belarus, where um, I think every morning people in, in Vilnius wake up knowing that if there was an accident there, uh, that it would affect everybody in Vilnius. And I, I will imagine that the government of uh, Lithuania uh, will remind everybody there that they are living in the shadow of a potential nuclear disaster there in Ostrovets. Finally, uh, the opposition, uh, the, the Belarusian opposition, which, as you know, lives today in Lithuania and in Poland, um, hopefully one day they will see opportunity to come back in there. Um, I can't tell. Um, I don't really know how strong Lukashenko is. He has strong security forces, but it's interesting that he has never agreed to sending his soldiers against Ukraine. I think either because he's concerned that they will refuse his orders or that they'll be destroyed in just a few weeks because they're, they're not any better than Russian troops are, uh, or that uh, it would weaken his own internal security. Um, so that, that tells me the, the weak position that he's in. 
Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much, General. Thank you very much, Thomas, for, for asking the questions and being with us. Uh, Anastasia, please. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so camera, much. Please your camera. Yeah. Uh, is it? Is it okay? Yes, yes, it's on. Okay, so thank you so much for your lecture. We are so grateful for you and for your time. And my question will be about like the future of uh, Russian regime. So if we talk about threats that comes from Russia to Europe, to Ukraine, to NATO, so to your point of view, like uh, what do you think about views that threat from Russia, the changing of regime or maybe separating uh, parts of Russia in different states, or it's um, better to to save these countries one, but in uh, uh, transforming the regime into more democratic or so, something like that. This will be a a good uh, uh, question to for us to end on. I think uh, for for today's session. Um, first, I want to say very clearly up front. I never advocate for regime change. You know, the United States has tried this with other countries two or three times in our past, and it never turns out the way you hope it will. And, and I think it's it's up to the internal, uh, the people of a country to make decisions about their own government. So in other words, for Russia, um, it's up to the Russian people to decide, do they want to continue living under this terrible regime that does nothing to make their life better, only sends their um, uh, soldiers to get slaughtered um, and only enriches a few people? Are they willing to continue doing that or are they gonna do something about it? Now, um, I think, of course, all of you know, uh, Russia has never been a, a nation state. It has been an empire for the last four or 500 years of some sort whether it was the czar or the soviets or uh, putin it's always been a an empire uh, and it felt it felt it was entitled to act like an empire that it could control the countries around it and uh and only a few people really benefited from the wealth uh that was not distributed and and people did not really have a voice not a real voice in their own government. Um, but I don't I don't see, I don't feel or hear strong feelings coming from the Russian public that they want to overthrow this. Um, now, obviously, Russia has a very, very strong, pervasive domestic security apparatus. Uh, many of you would be much more familiar with that than I am, either from your own experiences or from uh, maybe you have family or friends that live in Russia, um, but it does feel like that the like the regime is under enormous pressure right now. Uh, I'm not sure that President Putin really controls everything. Uh, the fact that Mr. Prigozhin openly uh, is critical, so openly criticizing the Minister of Defense and the Chief of the Russian General Staff uh, is so far defying an order to put himself under MOD. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, that's that kind of a public challenge is uh, a surprise to me. I imagine that of the 85 republics and entities and territories and oblasts that make up the Russian Federation, uh, many of them are there, of course, because they were colonized by one of the czars somewhere back in the history, um, that they they are looking for opportunity to finally break away. Chechnya is the one that I think of the most, uh, and uh, they seem to have the most capability. Mr. Kadyrov, um, I don't know exactly where his mind is, but or what he thinks. Does he see himself as the savior or the successor? Or is this a chance, a third Chechen war that could lead to successful breaking away? I don't know. But I do think the possibility is there for parts of the Federation to see opportunity. I think the Chinese do not want to see this, mainly because I think Chinese want to preserve status quo. Uh, they want to maintain access to cheap Russian energy. Uh, and as, as the polar ice cap continues to shrink. The Chinese want to be able to sail over the top of the globe. Um, 
So they don't want a lot of disruption inside Russia. Uh, and they're able to kind of go in and out of Russia anyway, out in the Eastern part of the Russian Federation and extract resources already. So if, if there's gonna be a change in regime, it's gonna happen because of uh, Ukrainian success or internal pressures that um, people that are um, see opportunity or they're so frustrated and unhappy with what Putin has done that they decide to take matters in their own hand. I don't think we have as much transparency in the Kremlin that we used to. Even during the Cold War, we had people who sort of understood who was next in line, who, who would be the follow the uh, uh, the premier. Uh, today, I don't think we really know that. There, it's it's not clear what the succession would be or what that would look like. I think that whoever comes after Putin could not be any worse. Um, he will be weaker because he will inherit a military that is greatly reduced thanks to Ukraine, and he will in, he will inherit a defense industry that is greatly reduced. And so, um, whoever comes next will be weaker and will probably have to focus on internal consolidation of power and less so on pushing projecting power outside of outside of Russia that's that's what i would uh, expect but if there's not if there's not a collapse if there's not a real change of regime then i think we'll continue to get people like putin uh, coming after him Thank you, General, and sorry, Natalia and Gennady, there will be no more questions as we are almost over. I would not forgive myself if I don't ask you this very, very quick question, General. So do you think, do you think that next year in Washington, D.C., when NATO is celebrating 75th anniversary, Ukraine can count on receiving this present? <laughs> well, of course, I'm going to say I certainly hope so. Um, I, I think that uh, I'm actually optimistic that we're going to get um, concrete steps coming out of Vilnius. I think it will be clear that there, there's so many nations that know that this is important. No nation wants to see any NATO summit be a failure. And, and I think it would be a failure if there are not some sort of concrete steps coming out of this. And, and so, yes, I would be much more optimistic about the 75th anniversary uh, summit uh, in Washington D.C., um, but let's 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 have Ukraine win this war first. Yes, let's keep fingers crossed, uh, Doctor Balasko. Uh, please. Uh, time is running out so fast, and uh, I uh, no doubt our audience has endless round of questions. Uh, but uh, we uh, leave there for following sessions with uh, General. Uh, and uh, uh, unlike the President Biden, uh, you say that Ukraine win is winning. Ukraine should win. And we appreciate your lecture. We appreciate your time and uh, the opportunities for our students, uh, scholars, friends, international friends uh, to have a chance uh, to speak with you. And uh, I think we'll uh, schedule uh, and for in another session with you and uh, leave all the questions for th this time. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> Thank you for the privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we agree with uh, Professor Balat because the time is running up. So we thank heartfully from the bottom of our hearts to Lieutenant, uh, to Lieutenant General Ben Hodges for supporting of Ukraine, for these optimistic speeches, for these presentations, for these uh, optimistic uh, information for us. And uh, we will see you hopefully very soon with the next interesting topic, which we'll discuss later. And the information will be distributed among all of you. Thank you so much, General.